It's great to welcome back to the program Tim Miller. Tim is the author of Why We Did It, a travelogue from the Republican Road to Hell. His show is available on Snapchat and it's called Not My Party. He also has a new show on the Bulwark's YouTube page with Bill Crystal called Ballot Box. Tim, great to have you back on. Hey, David, good to be back, man. Let's start with the viral Carrie Lake confrontation. My audience may remember this very interesting and in some ways unusual idiosyncratic, we might call it conversation you had with Carrie Lake, where I mean, listen, the way I summarize it is that you as a child of the Republican Party basically said to her, listen, I'm aligned with you on a bunch of stuff. You're talking about Trump won an election that he actually lost. This seems like a bad idea. You're turning people like me off. You're turning other people off. She wasn't like hugely receptive to you, was she? Uh, that's an understatement. And I guess she's willing to play ball. So I, I will give Carrie Lake credit. She's willing to spar. And a lot yeah. of, you know, I was always a moderate Republican. So a lot of the, the remaining moderate Republicans, to the extent that there are some, they won't even deal with me, right? Because they see me as a traitor. And, and Carrie at least will have an exchange of views. So I, that's the one nice thing I'll say. And the main premise of the interview was I was saying to her, look, you probably would have been governor if you would have just tried to appeal to the John McCain, Doug right. Ducey type of voter, you know, the types of people that I used to work for, but you didn't, you know, you spat in our faces and you, uh, you know, advanced a bunch of weird conspiracies about the vaccine and then about the election. Um, I was at her event. I, I, I brought up that, you know, for the, when I was guest hosting on the circus, I went to one of her events like three days before the election. Steve Bannon is there. Pizzagate Jack Posobiec is there. <laughs> like, why are you campaigning with these people three days before the election in a swing state? And so in some ways I was like, help me help you, I, which I don't really want to help her. But that was kind of the conceit of the argument. And she just wouldn't she can't concede any of that. Right. She just she can't give in. And I think that she senses rightly that her power within the party and anybody's power within the party these days emanates from the MAGA voter base. And if she's seen to concede to somebody like me and never Trump or even one inch, then she'll lose street cred. And maybe she can't win general elections, but she can still become kind of a hero within the party as long as she maintains her hold on the MAGA base. That I, She didn't say that, but that's how I'd psychoanalyze her. And, and she put the video out. So I don't know. I thought I embarrassed her, but she thought it was good enough to put it out. So I think that shows that like her audience isn't gettable swing voters or David Pakman's audience like her audience is these MAGA folks that want to see her telling me that I'm wrong. What did you make of when she kind of strangely touched you in the middle of it where and like I <laughs> uh, some of my colleagues at the board get mad at me because I'm also a touch. I'm generally a toucher. It's OK. I'm you can hug me if you see me yeah. out in public and we're pals. It was. But to me, it felt manipulative. Right. right. It's like it's one thing to pat me on the shoulder, but she tried to grab both of my hands like a condescending, you know, aunt, you know, telling you like telling you that you need to start behaving and stop smoking cigarettes. And I was like, I don't like this is not the this is not the environment for that. So uh, <laughs> that caught me off guard. And I, I think it probably just like the fact that I don't really want Carrie Lake touching me in any environment definitely had an impact as well. So, I mean, this kind of gets to what I want to hear from you. It's, it's been about a year since we spoke, 11 months maybe or something like that. We now have a, a Republican primary in which uh, Donald Trump has 63 percent of the polling support. As of today, everybody else is fighting for what is now 47 percent. DeSantis went from 31 to 11. Nikki Haley went from one to 12. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy in the middle of a surge is now at four and he's basically done. And Chris Christie, who I think is the most sane man on the stage, is polling 3.3. So. What do you see as I mean, listen, I think unless Trump's dead, he's the nominee. I, I'm curious to hear whether you agree. There's people talking about, well, if Nikki Haley overperforms Iowa and then brings momentum to New Hampshire and then gets to her home state, is it is it Trump? Is that is it it? No. Yeah. Trump is going to be the nominee. I, the, the party voters want Trump. Uh, you know, all the pundits, we can all try to come up with a way and fantasize different solutions for which it won't be Trump. But but I've always I've been saying for a few months now that cons that co the conceit, the consolidation needed to happen, that they need to consolidate behind one candidate to, to defeat Trump in a one on one. I, I thought that was wrong from the start. I was like, consolidation helps Trump. What mm. people do not understand is that Trump has a core base of cultists, right? That's about. 40% of the party, probably, um, maybe 33 if you want to be on a nice day. But then there's this other group of people that like Trump a lot. 
that are in the middle of the party, but that maybe are ready to move on for whatever reason. Like maybe they want somebody younger or maybe, you know, and, and these are people that some of them are with, most of them are with DeSantis, some are with Vivek, um, even a couple are with Haley. And so you saw when Tim Scott dropped out, like his 3% didn't all go to Haley. Much of right. that went to Trump. Right. Right. Because a lot of people, he Trump is a lot of people's second choice. I think that's what a lot of pundits misunderstand. I, there is a, there is maybe, you know, twenty percent of the party that really is ready to move on from doesn't like him at all. Mild people. You have the Chris Christie three percent you mentioned, and then some percentage of the Vicky Haley vote. So maybe it's more like fifteen percent. Yeah. But that's not enough to do anything. Like fifteen. I, so it's not nobody. There, those people exist in the universe, but but it's not nearly enough to win a primary. And so if if Nikki, let's say Nikki gets second, Iowa DeSantis drops out. Probably 60% of the DeSantis vote goes to Trump. So, right. so people are like, Nikki needs DeSantis to drop out to get momentum. Wrong. Like, you know, if DeSantis drops out, that is only going to help Trump because it's the party that the party wants Trump. And that's just the fundamental reality. I wish that weren't the case, but that's the truth. So you wrote this piece, the Matt Gates GOP future, and in it you kind of go through. Well, here's here's what's going on with with some of the diff, you know Vivek and different people and kind of contextualizing what what the next generation may look like. I struggle to imagine that the immediate future of the Republican Party is the Hindu Indian guy. I just struggle to think that that's the future. Right. Uh, from an identity perspective, Matt Gates makes a lot more sense. It seems like Matt Gates is a continuation of MAGA, right? I think so. And I appreciated your interview with, uh, with Vivek, by the way. Um, uh, well, watch, I was following him around Iowa and watching it. Um, the Gates to me is the continuation of MAGA. He's different than Trump in certain ways, right? So you have to define what is MAGA. And and to me, uh, the 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 premise of the article is I spend a lot of time around young MAGA types, Turning Point USA, young Republicans. And and the first question I always ask them, what are the issues you care about? Right. And what they always say is immigration, no foreign entanglements that are unnecessary, and woke stuff broadly defined. Sometimes I'll mm -hmm. say trans, sometimes race, whatever. Um, okay, so that's their issue matrix. Right. So the young up and coming Republicans, that's what they care about. Well, who represents that? Gates, Vivek. Again, he's got some identity issues that prevent that. And those types, J.D. Vance, maybe. Right. right. Like that is where the party is going. The young voters, you know, none of them say if, like you went back to 1992 when I was at college Republican events. You said, what do you care about? You know, it would have been tax cuts. Uh, abortion, strong military, right? None of that stuff is even said. Um, some of that they maintain, but that's not the thing that animates them. And and the problem is, or not the problem, but the, there's the establishment Republican Party still doesn't realize this. And this is why Gates was able to overthrow McCarthy with the support of literally nobody. It was Steve Bannon and Matt Gates. That was it. And seven other random congressmen. Fox was against him. McConnell was against him. McCarthy was against him. Even Trump was kind of neutral. But but the, but it's because the voters want the Gates mold that he had the power to be able to do that, despite the institutional opposition. I think that's just a huge sign of where the party's headed. One of the things we see during presidential campaigns is sort of a suspension of disbelief in this sense. Three days ago at an event in Iowa, Vivek Ramaswamy talked about when someone mentioned his wife, he said she's going to make a fantastic first lady. And it's like we're all living in a fantasy world because you're not you're in the race. We all know you're not going to win. You know, you're not going to win, et cetera. What I want to know from you is as someone who's been behind the scenes of so many of these things, when someone like Tim Scott says I'm running and then he pulls between one and two the entire time and then drops out and none of us are surprised. Is he surprised? What is the calculation that makes Tim Scott say, I guess I'm running for president. I'll run a couple months and then I'll drop out or like Francis Suarez, who pulled zero. And when he was asked, how much did you raise? He was like, it's definitely thousands. And then he quietly drops out. What what is the point of running for them? Yeah, Suarez might have been a grifter, but I think that the Scots of the world and the Vivek's and, and even DeSantis, even Haley probably right now, you know, I, I think they're not totally delusional. They recognize that Trump is the favorite, but but there's a lot of mind games you can play with yourself and self delusion. If this hmm. happens, if that happens, right? And I was people always called me Rain Cloud on campaigns when I worked for Jeb and John Huntsman people because I was on this guy in meetings that was like, "We're gonna lose, guys. We gotta change." Shit. And every, all the my colleagues were like, "Well, Tim, but you know this could." And, and so I think that the self delusion is there. And a big, you know, my big observation about what feeds this self delusion is you get in these little bubbles. You know, mm. Tim Scott is at events and at fundraisers that are self-selecting. They're people right. that are open to Tim Scott. 
you know, and so he hears all this positive info. And then on the street, you know, I remember with Jeb, we're, we're like in fifth place. We're walking down the street in New York. Every block, one person's like, Jeb, I love you. But here's the thing. You walk past a thousand people on every block and the one guy that says, I love you might be trolling you, you know, or they <laughs> might really like you or they might really like you, but I actually like Marco a little better. Right. But when you're hearing that every block, somebody's being like, Jeb, I love you. Tim Scott, I love you. You're like, wait a minute. Something might be happening here. And I, and, and I sense that that's happening with these guys. And I know it's happening with Vivek because when I followed him around, his campaign team is irrationally optimistic because he goes to these events that have huge crowds. But the problem is most of the people in these crowds are for Trump. But, right. but it makes him feel like it's an ego boost. You know, it makes him feel like, oh, maybe there's something here. I'm curious about your view on. Uh, well, my view on the economy right now is can I find problems with this economy? Of course, we haven't solved inequality. There's people who don't have health care. There's people who can't afford food. There's people whose wages haven't kept up with inflation. We have all those things. But if you look at the top five or six metrics that for 50 years we've used to measure an economy, they all look pretty good. And if you look in history at when you have an economy that looks like the one today, based on those metrics, presidents running for reelection tend to get reelected. Super 30,000 foot yeah. level. If you were advising whoever is the eventual Republican nominee or running against this economy right now or whatever, would you say this is a big problem for whoever's trying to take out Biden, that the economy looks like this today? I don't think so right now for a couple of reasons. And, and you know, I, on the show I do with Bill Crystal, he's the old timer over there on the Bulwark feed. He, he was there for HW in 92. Mm -hmm. and, and he worries that there's this parallel with Biden. That the, the economy was getting better for HW in 92, but it just wasn't getting better quite fast enough, right? People were still feeling the lag of the previous recession. And, and I think that there's a little bit of that happening with inflation right now. And, and so I, I'm concerned about that from the Biden perspective, that, that while the economy is objectively getting better, people are still kind of feeling the lag of, of the inflation and, and they're not going to come to terms with the economy being better until hopefully next summer or next fall, but maybe before it's too late. So I worry about that. And I think that Biden needs to be out there selling much harder on this and, and needs a more, a more aggressive surrogate team selling mm. this, selling the progress, the direction you know, what's happening in red states, what's happening in red areas, the manufacturing, the chips. I know that they're going to do all that, but I, I, I would like to see more, louder, faster. On the yep. Republican side, I think probably their strategy is let's try to keep this lag of people's felt experience of the economy as long as possible. The more like I just keep you saying it's there, bad, keep yeah. saying it's bad. Yeah, 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 yeah. The more I remind you that bread's more expensive because that's true. Right. Like yeah. In the macro, it might be untrue that the economy is bad. But in the micro, you can find things that feel worse, like your grocery bill is a little bit higher than it used to be. I got a you loaf know? of sourdough the other day. It was nine dollars. And that thing happened where there's holes in the middle where I feel like I got half a loaf. And, right. and I, I could Literally. blame Joe Biden for that, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> I, I think that is going to be the Republican strategy. And it's going it's to take, you know, some of this hopefully will happen naturally with the lag. But some of it is going to take an aggressive, I don't want to call it a propaganda effort, but a promotional effort of, of the areas of progress coming from the Democrats. Yeah. And, you know, when you think back to Trump predicting in 2020 that under Biden, the stock market would do what it did in 1929 and then it's at an all time high. And then two weeks ago, Trump says the same thing will happen if Biden wins in 2024. You would think that could never work, but it sounds like you're saying just kind of keep at it. And, and some people will believe it, I guess. I do think so. And the other thing is people are, are, are not this is not fair, but I'm just telling you the reality. People are not judging Trump on what on COVID. They just aren't like a lot of people. There are a lot of voters. Some are some like Democrats, but some voters out there are judging what was happening before COVID. I think that's unfair. I think that's bullshit. But, but that means that Biden has to have an effort, a counter effort to that, to them saying things have gotten worse by saying, no, actually, things have gotten better. If you compare things to 2020, crime rates down. Uh, fentanyl deaths are down. Like all the things that they say are horrible have actually gotten better since 2020. But people don't know that. And, and like they, they don't intuitively think it because they are still a little bit elevated from where they were in 2017. You know, and so uh, like I think there is a big communications game that's happening here that both sides are going to play. Biden has a lot of facts on his side, not all the facts yep. um, that he hasn't been. You know, I, I, I kind of Biden has been, you know, for a moderate Republican type, a pretty good president. I have some complaints. But, but this is a weakness of his, you know, and it's part of the age thing. Like he's just not that con convincing of a messenger sometimes. And he needs help from his from allies, I think, to make this sale. hundred percent. Couldn't couldn't agree with you more on that. Um, 
has the there was this period where there were the early early big Republican donors lining up behind DeSantis. This is when he was polling like 30 and then they've kind of evaporated as the polling has has gone down. And then you anecdotally hear about some of those nebulous people now see Nikki Haley as the only person who maybe can take down Trump. But they're not donating to Nikki Haley in any significant numbers, right? I mean, there, there is there there doesn't seem to be a serious movement of anti-Trump Republican donors that are saying we believe so strongly in Haley that we'll actually start giving her a bunch of money. Yeah. All right, David, you've hit one of my pet issues. These donors, like they're delusional, and and the media coverage of it, I think, is stupid. It doesn't matter. Republican voters hate these people. Right. They, they don't hate they, they hate the rich rhino Republican donor class more than they hate Democrats. Right. Mm. So and so it doesn't work. And these ads. Yeah. DeSantis raised a ton of money, 200 million. Nikki's raising a decent amount of money, not as much as DeSantis. Yep. But but they put you watch the ads. Go watch them yourself on YouTube. Like they're terrible. It, it's just they're either these gauzy, generic ads about why Nikki Haley's good. Sometimes. And that's passive- what they're paying for. I just assumed that couldn't possibly be what there must be something else in Iowa that I'm not seeing that no. they're paying for. You're you're saying no, it's you're they're paying for it. YouTube videos? Yeah, no, and oh my ads, their ads are going on TV, but you can watch the ads on YouTube, yeah. is what I mean. But and, and yeah, yeah. it's the same pre-roll ads though you're seeing. Right. And, and and it's door knockers, they're paying for that. But it's like this doesn't work. Donald Trump, these people are in a Donald Trump cult. They're not going to watch one thirty second. This is not like a state legislative race where TV ads really matter, right? You can, right. If you don't know who your state senator is and an ad comes up and you're like, state senator or so-and-so is terrible. Another state senator is up from their bootstraps working man. Right? That could convince you because you don't know anything about any of the candidates. These right. people know everything about Trump. And so this money is just being pissed away for no reason. And, and these donors think that they're the masters of the universe and can control and puppeteer the party when they keep when the party keeps telling them no, like like they didn't want Trump in 16. They didn't want Trump at 20. They, they, excuse me. They wanted Kevin McCarthy to stay. They didn't want Matt Gates. They didn't want Trump this time. Like, why do they think that their, their donation to matters anymore? It does. It's a different world. It's not 2012 anymore. That's for sure. That's for sure. Tim Miller, author of why we did it, a travel log from the Republican road to hell, the Snapchat show, not my party. The YouTube show on the Bulwark's YouTube page with Bill Crystal called Ballot Box. Tim, always appreciate your time and your insights. David, thanks, brother. We'll we'll talk to you anytime during the campaign. Holler anytime.